So it's really exciting to come here uh, as I've now been at RailsCon for I think uh, 13 years, 12 years, something like that, and see how many new people are here. That this isn't just a community that's growing old together. Although some of us are growing old. Um, there's a lot of fresh faces and there's a lot of people coming into the industry right now. And I think the industry really needs that. I think this is a unique time for us to do things differently in a lot of ways and think differently. And I think a lot of that doing differently and thinking differently needs to come from people who are showing up here for the first time or just showed up in the industry. When I first showed up in the industry, I went to a, a conference in 2001. That was my first conference ever. I met the creator of Ruby. Uh, Mats and I read or met a bunch of other people and I was so excited but I still had no idea really about where I was why I was there what was going on so I just started programming and about two years after that Rails was born and I think Rails was born the way it was born because I was one of those people who showed up and knew nothing I had a very little understanding of the history of computer science, of, well, computer science in general, and I thought, okay, I, I'm just gonna try. I'm gonna try to do the things that I think are right. And that led to, to something that was different, that Rails wasn't like the other things. And I think that difference comes from that ignorance of youth whether that youth is actually in years or whether it's an experience or whether it's just in a new community that you haven't been somewhere before and you show up and you're green and you don't know what you're not supposed to do or not supposed to start or not supposed to question. I think that's incredibly powerful. The flip side of that, and I'll talk about that a little more later too, is that when you don't know anything, um, that's not always the best either or to say that there's a trade-off to that. That that ignorance sometimes means you hit your head on the same things that people who went before you hit their head on, or you walk into the same traps that other people walked into. So there's this weird place um, where on the one hand, it's wonderful to know nothing, and on the other hand, it's kind of a hampering. So I'm gonna try to thread that needle in this talk this morning. Well, actually, let me confess something. It won't be much of a confession in a moment, but this is not a talk. This is a uh, reading. I wrote my entire talk out, and I've sort of done that in the past in sketches, and then I've gone up on stage, and then I've tried to just freestyle what came to mind at the moment when I saw the slide on the board in front of me. But I'm gonna try something different this year, and that is to actually read my talk. So this is not a talk, this is a reading. But don't worry, there will be pictures too. Um, and that's actually one of the things that got me to, to thinking about reading, is I read a lot these days. I read several books every night. One of them is uh, Llama Llama Red Pajama. Um, I don't read that as often anymore, they kind of got tired of that, but I read books every night and I really enjoy it. Not only because uh, you get to read and that's fun, um, but also because you get to read something that was considered. And I sometimes have the sense that when, in the past, I've walked up on stage, yeah, I had rough ideas about connections I wanted to make, but considered is perhaps a big word at times. So I wanted to read something that I had considered over a period of more than just whatever the three seconds of my synapses firing before I said something was. The other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to, to do a bit of a reenactment. This is um, Giles Bouquet who in 2003 did a dramatic reading of a blog post I wrote called Rails is Omikase. <laughs> and he did it as sort of a, a spoof, and I encourage you all to look it up after this talk. Just go on YouTube, uh, Rails is Omikase, and this will be the first thing that pops up. And, and Giles is a great dramatic reader. And I was thinking of his voice 
imitating and mocking me in his uh, YouTube video and thinking, I want to try to do that with myself, for myself. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to, to say, this is um, Aaron Patterson. Um, I, most people probably don't know what, who Aaron is, uh, but they do know who Tender Love is. <laughs> this is Tender Love giving a talk at uh, Code Genius in 2015. And I think the way I ended up there was uh, through the YouTube recommendation algorithm. I went to Giles, and, and then they recommended other people who trolled people, and, and Tender Love showed up. <laughs> he was the first recommendation from the algorithm. And the way he introduced his uh, talk was to say, um, this is not a soft talk. This is a technical talk. This will not be a talk about how to find yourself. And I thought, wow, this is really pathetic because my talk is the opposite of all that. This talk is not a technical talk. It is a soft talk, although I think we've kind of moved on from that uh, way of addressing things because I don't think actually any of these topics that I've tried to examine here are soft or easy in any ways. In fact, it's taking me far longer to learn and appreciate these concepts than it has to try to appreciate the intricacies of programming. Um, and it is about how to find yourself, or at least it is about how I found myself in open source and in this community. But that's the wonderful thing about conferences is that you don't just hear the same shit 50 times. People show up with different ideas and different approaches, and, uh, and that's how it should be. So with that, final warning, um, even though this is a reading and I did consider these words, this is not a final manuscript. I have not labored over this for years. Um, I've labored over this for weeks um, or a month, actually about a year. I usually start thinking and noodling about the things I want to talk about at RailsConf about a year in advance and I jot them all down in my notes app on my phone and then like a, a child on Christmas, I giggle when I open it uh, two weeks before the conference and think, I wonder what I thought about this year and, and what I want to think about. <laughs> so that is to say that um, there really aren't any new ideas in this talk. There's a set of connections between existing ideas that I will try to present, which really is, is a good description of my life's work. I don't have a lot of new ideas. I, I make connections between existing ideas, and then I present those connections to others. Um, and like that code, uh, the code that I release, it's not finished. It needs patches, and I'm sure it has bugs, so take that in mind. And doesn't cover all the cases either. So I'm really putting this up partly as a warning and partly as a disclaimer, just so I can say it once, that this isn't a universal truth I'm presenting and it will not apply to everyone and it will not apply in all situations. The main thing it applies to is me and you're free to extrapolate as you see fit. Okay, let's begin. In that, the first 5,000 years, anthropologist David Graeber explores the fascinating history of debt, money, and economies. It starts out by debunking the common myth that prior to coinage, everyone were trapped in this inefficient mode of barter. If you had a chicken to give and you wanted sugar from uh, Gandalf, but Gandalf was a vegetarian, you first had to trade your chicken to Frodo, uh, who would give you the barley that Gandalf wanted for sugar. All you wanted was a cup of sugar and now you're out of chicken and left with a whole bunch of barley. What a terrible state of society. This is how most economists from Adam Smith Ford have described what they imagined the primitive, inefficient barter economies prior to the advent of coinage looked like. It's a great sales pitch for modern commerce, but unfortunately, as great of details, it's also mostly made up bullshit. Communities prior to the advent of coinage didn't seek to settle their trades on the spot, at least not within those communities. They relied on much more egalitarian, long-running concept of reciprocity. Uh, forms much closer to the communist slogans of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs than the quid pro quo paradigm we all take for granted in this market-based society. 
The problem, as seen with modern eyes, with early pre-money egalitarian society, was in part that they didn't scale. Have you, have you heard that one before? Um, they relied on community bonds to enforce a collective sense of what was good for the group as a whole, backed by effective corrective measures of family obligations and honor. Uh, getting ostracized was always there in the background. Such a social structure is much easier to maintain at the level of a tribe, say, the city or nation state. But why? Largely because of the freeloader problem. The fear that if we don't feel like we have direct family bonds that tie our shared faith together in pursuit of a common good, society is going to fill up with moochers and leeches. Those who exploit others to do all the hard work while they enjoy the fruits of that labor. That fear remains central to modern societies. Witness the evergreen political appeal of pointing out the excesses of welfare kings and queens or the danger posed by immigration. This is a fear rooted in freeloader fear, which in turn is based on the notion of scarce resources in need of protection. There just isn't enough to go around, and the party is already full. And humankind does have some reasonable historical scars that have kept it from forgetting the Malthusian spectrum. This idea that there really is a hard limit for how many people a given society can support before it runs out of resources and everyone suffers. These scars were formed by millennia of virtually non-existing productivity growth, which kept the human race in check by the constraints of not enough food, um, and thus constantly being liable to famines, plagues, and other consequences of lives lived at the threshold of subsistence. Against this backdrop of history, it's not surprising that the paradigm of scarcity and the fear of freeloaders is deeply embedded in the human psyche, and that it colors most forms of interaction and collaboration, even when doing so is more of an outdated stain than anything. When I was getting into the industry in the mid to late 90s, it seemed like we were witnessing the peak of an epic battle between proprietary and free software. This war was embodied at the proprietary end of the spectrum by Bill Gates and Microsoft, the ultimate proprietary extractors, dominators, and conquerors. And at the free software end of the spectrum by Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation, the ultimate software freedom fighters. And there's no doubt that these two men were diametrically opposed on many of the key questions about software development and how it should be made and how it should be distributed. But that stark contrast also had a tendency to overshadow the way in which the two were strikingly similar. Both Gates and Stallman built their life's work on the back of copyright law. One with the right to extract gobs of money from his proprietary software monopoly. The other with the right to extract contributions and distribution concessions from users of his open source software. These rights are both founded in a libertarian ideal of ultimate personal freedom backed by strong property rights enforced by state apparatus through contracts and courts. The fact that these arch enemies should share some common ideological base really shouldn't be that much of a surprise. They were both American men born in the 1950s who attended Ivy League universities came of age during the oil crisis, and were around for the birth of the personal computer. That's a lot of shared societal forces and context exerted on both with ties to the concept of scarcity. You might find this comparison a stretch or perhaps even offensive, and I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, I don't mean to equate the two men's contributions to software or those of the organizations that are led in terms of virtue or vice. In fact, for the purpose of this discussion, I don't even think that's a terribly interesting topic. What I do think is interesting 
is how both Gates and Stallman anchored their worldview in a scarcity paradigm that embraced a similar fear of freeloaders and relied on software licenses, that is, contracts, to counter it. Gates was afraid that users would take his software and not pay him for it. Stallman was afraid that users would extend his software and not hand over the contributions. Both men believed that the distribution of software was a trade exchange, one that had to be bound by certain explicit debt obligations, which had to be settled or else. Neither Gates nor Stallman were unique in their seal to control the terms under which their software was used and distributed. Most of the software world fall into this category, share the same mistrust of users, consider some level of debt obligations for using software completely natural. In fact, when I'm wearing my capitalist cape as the co-owner of the software company Basecamp, I too fall into this category. But when I'm wearing my Rails conductor's cap, it's a different story. <laughs> then the whole premise of strong property rights and debt obligations start to look awfully screwy. Look at the way we talk about the freeloader problem in general in the open source world. We commonly reach for the tragedy of the commons to explain why licenses, contracts, and a sense of explicit debt obligations are necessary. The tragedy of the commons tells us that individual users will act independently to seek their own maximum self-interest. So if there's nothing to rein in their native drives, we're bound to end up with a barren pasture as people just take, 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 and nobody feels obliged to give. I believe this is a complete conceptual misappropriation for open source software development. One that has done great harm to our understanding of what we do as open source software writers. The magic of software is that there is virtually no marginal cost. That's the economic reality that Gates used to build Microsoft's empire. And what enabled Stallman to give away his free software, albeit with strings attached. The freeloaders are free. There is no practical scarcity to worry about. If you accept that there is no scarcity and there is no tragedy of the commons, that is, open source software cannot be overgrazed by having more people use it, that freeloaders are free, then you're forced to look skeptically at other assumptions we've started to make lately in the broader open source community. Like the idea that open source software just isn't sustainable. That unless we find a new way to force users to give back, i.e. donate or pay, we're going to burn out the people who donate their free labor but won't do so forever. In essence, we're at the cusp of a Malthusian Randis crisis. <laughs> too many takers, too few and too poorly compensated makers. Never mind the fact that actual observed famines are so rare that everyone keeps using the same example when it comes to this debate. Open SSL, a famine that was so promptly alleviated uh, as soon as the effects were apparent. And that is unlike Thomas Malthus, who at least had a few millennia of actual devastating famines to point to. The problem with the free labor perspective within open source is that it narrowly defines creation and collaboration on the same marketplace terms as proprietary software. That it is an exchange of goods and services. That by choosing to use a certain open source package, you're actually accruing real debt to the makers of this software, whether you like it or not, and you're obligated to settle those debts at regular intervals. That be one-off monetary donations or continuously paid to subscriptions. Um, it's kind of in the vein of an Oracle licensing agreement that your contribution, your give back, is supposed to scale with your usage and your benefit, like a uh, per CPU pricing scheme. The bigger the business, the bigger the bill. 
But isn't it ironic that the same reality of zero marginal costs, the foundation of these incredibly profitable commercial software empires, is the same one that allows us to actually reject this market-based framing of collaboration altogether? Now, I'm not saying there's something categorically wrong with developers developing open source on market-based terms. What I am saying is that it isn't a necessary condition of sustainability. That there are large successful projects, and many smaller too, like Ruby on Rails, that have thrived on rejecting the market-based approach. And it's showing no signs of an impending Malthusian doom. On the contrary, when I look at the literally billions of dollars in business that's been done on the basis of this thing I started, I don't look at that with envy or an open mouth. I don't think I should have had some of that. I think what a wonderful world. I put something into this world and continue to put my life into that something which has benefited a tremendous amount of people. And yes, created a tremendous amount of business. From a grateful $20 billion business of Shopify to let's say a um, less grateful $20 billion business of Twitter. <laughs> if my outlook on my work with Rails had been infected by this aggrieved notion of free labor, both of these would look like failures. Like freeloaders who got away with it without paying their dues, just because no money changed hands. Now, if I had this outlook, maybe I'd cut Shopify some slack because of the contributions that they've gracefully given back to the community and continue to do so. But I would certainly look with contempt and even anger at Twitter. Not only did Twitter never contribute any material things back to the framework, the company ran for cover under the consequences of their own poor architectural decisions in a narrative that blamed Rails for their troubles. What an ungrateful bunch. What an injustice, or whatever. <laughs> if I was a Christian, I'd say, turn the other cheek. And as an inspiring stoic, I think of Aurelius' admonishment that it doesn't hurt me unless I interpret its happening as harmful to me, and I can choose not to. Neither Shopify nor Twitter nor any other person or company holds the power to cause tragedy to our commons in Rails. There is no tragedy. There will be no tragedy. Rails is a celebration of utopian commons, a land where honey and milk spring eternal, or at least unrelated to how many people are tapping in. Again, this is not a universal truth. I'm saying this as one possible truth, an experienced and enduring truth for the work and the community that's been happening around Rails. It's worth noting that this utopian paradise with the tragedy of the commons, where the tragedy of the commons bear no influence on in our work, does require a bit of mental self-defense, or at least uh, ring fencing. It's relatively easy to deal with the distance and gratitude of a Twitter. As I mentioned, I wasn't actually looking for any gratitude from Twitter in the first place. And nobody from Twitter overtly showed up to demand that I fix their problems or to apologize for the fact that I hadn't or wouldn't. It's a little different when people actually do, um, which they do, or at least they, they did. It's not as common as it once was, uh, even if I still see it all the time. But here's how that mental self-defense looked like in the early days. Back in 2005, this is the V1 firewall that I erected to protect myself against vendoritis. This is from a the first Rails conference in Canada, and this is a slide with a succinct message. Um, that if I was to release others from being indebted to me for using Rails, I surely had to be released from others expecting me to be indebted to them for using Rails. You might think that latter release is obvious, but marketplace norms are hard to escape. 
they seep into our unconsciousness. There are plenty of open source users who think themselves less as a recipient of a gift and more like customers with warranty claims. That they've done the makers of set open source software a great honor by merely choosing to use their thing. In fact, it's kind of a natural extension of a society that wor worships consumerism above little else. A natural extension of the customer is always right. Of the adversarial relationship between buyer and seller. And a lot of open source communities actively entice this sort of thinking and behavior. They're so over the top grateful for attention and adoption that they put themselves in this subservient position. Hey, whatever you gotta do to make the sale, right? No, let there be no sale. Now, I accept that um, this might seem a little strange coming from me of all people. I used all sorts of commercial marketing tricks in the early days of Rails. There was selling going on, there's no doubt about that. But it wasn't really for a commercial purpose, but rather, dare I say it, an ideological one. Perhaps a more accurate term would be proselytizing. I was engaged in the promotion of an ideology, a paradigm, and even a worldview. That might seem like a subtle distinction, and it probably is, but I'm still somewhat regretful that this approach led others down this commercial track without that distinction in place and to this questionable end. Today, much of open source is sold on these marketplace terms. Everything is slick. There's your video, there's your cool marketing side, and of course you have a sweet logo. It's more than a little hard to see the difference between an open source software package and a commercial one. I used to think that this was unequivocally a win for open source. That to fight for attention with commercial alternatives, we had to adopt the commercial playbook. Now I think it's at the very least a mixed blessing. That if you show up like a salesman, it's a little disingenuous to be surprised when people think they're buying a product. One way to start swinging the pendulum back towards the days before the commercialization of open source, and I don't mean that in the sense of Red Hat or whatever, but in the sense of open source thinking it had to outsell the salesman, is to look at our founding documents. This is the MIT license in full. It was conceived 30 years ago. 20 lines of light legalese, of which just six deliver the radical punch. Do whatever you want, do as you please, just don't sue. The MIT license is often lumped in with other open source licenses because of its compatibility with the likes of GPL or other copyleft licenses. That makes it seem like they're really just flavors of the same thing, but they're not. In many ways, I consider the MIT license under which Rails is distributed to be as different from copyleft licenses like the GPL as it is from commercial proprietary software. The MIT license, to a large extent, is the anti-license, the utopian of socialized programs, one that embraces the lack of marginal costs for software goods. It's an explicit rejection of strong property rights approach taken by both Gates and Stallman at their respective ends of the libertarian spectrum. It's the language of giving without expecting anything in return. It's the language of sincere charity, a charity without strings attached, neither commercial nor reciprocal. With the risk of sounding sanctimonious, I read it as a pure projection of altruism. It's kind of funny to analyze the MIT license from this perspective because I do remember feeling the pull of a primordial debt to the software community when I started Rails, a motion to give back now that I had something to give. I was born into the software community through the grace of open source. And now I had the opportunity to participate as a contributor and it felt wonderful. But it felt like that exactly because no sword was hanging over my head. Nobody telling me that this is what I ought or had to do. No one expecting me to do it. 
So it was an act of volition rather than one of duty, a truly authentic choice. That, to me, is freedom. The freedom to pursue self-actualization and making something in my image, the best that I possibly knew how. Again, not as free labor, but as a literal labor of love. As an amateur in the original sense of the word. Something that in all honesty has been worth far more than money or reciprocal gestures to me. And I say that with the clarity of my privilege, but also from having been on either side of the money while working on Rails. When I started working on Rails in 2003, Jason Fried, my then boss and now business partner at Basecamp, was paying me $25 an hour. In itself, a princely sum up from the $15 an hour I was getting paid when we started working together in 2001. I was attending the Copenhagen Business School I didn't have rich parents supporting me, though I did have the backing of a functional welfare state that sees the wisdom in educating its young without trapping them in student debt. So, <laughs> I, I had the Danish privilege, which is a privilege, but also one shared by another five million-ish people and, and far more in similar societies around the world. Um, Anyway, this was my income, and yet I poured a substantial amount of my spare time into making rails. Hours that I did not bill Jason for. Talk about free labor. Except it wasn't an investment to curry favor with an employer. Or even as some shrewd career play for the long term. In fact, I didn't see it as an investment at all. I wasn't doing it expecting any rewards or advantages. Then or in the future. It simply wasn't a project underwritten by a market-based worldview. On the self-actualization front, it was about the three components of motivation, as Daniel Pink summarized in his book, Drive. Autonomy, mastery, purpose. Autonomy to engage the challenges that I deemed interesting in the order that pleased me in a style that appealed to me. Mastery as a pursuit for its own sake, learning all the intricacies of this beautiful, sparkling gem of a language, Ruby having my mind blown by metaprogramming and DSLs. And finally, a twofold purpose of using Ruby to build something real, but even more so to build something that would allow others to pass through these same rings of delight that I'd been sprinting through. That last bit is nibbling at what Abraham Maslow called self-transcendence in the work that preceded his standard pyramid of needs with its five layers of progression. The greatest attainment of identity, autonomy, or selfhood is itself a going beyond and above selfhood. Which, too, is, of course, but an echo of what's been said a million times in history. Here's someone saying it, Mr. Rogers, at a commencement speak in 2002. Deep down, we know that what matters in this life is more than winning for ourselves, what really matters is helping others win, too. That there's a deep sense of satisfaction that comes from having done work that's genuinely useful to other people. Again, not in the sense of market terms, where you sold someone something useful and you're pleased with the transaction, but the absence of transactions altogether. What's unique about Maslow Insight is in how the pyramid of needs helps us with a roadmap to making that happen. It clarifies why we at times do not feel like we're either able to win for ourselves or to strive to help others win. Because we're stuck at the base levels. Either in reality, which is depressingly true here in the US, being deprived of security and safety, or in our minds. Now, I'll forgive you if you think this talk of self-transcendence sounds either like some religious hocus-pocus or some new age hippy-dippy bullshit. I'm pretty sure that would have been my reaction in 2003 at the age of 23 when I started working on Rails. Which is kind of the sneaky wonder of Ruby and Matt's vision. How it echoes that timeless conclusion that Maslow and Mr. Rogers and many others have reached. Matt's 
speaks in the uncontroversial, approachable terms of happiness. Who doesn't want happiness? The goal of Ruby is to make programmers happy. I started out to make a programming language that would make me happy. And as a side effect, it's made many, many programmers happy. I hope to see Ruby help every programmer in the world to become productive and to enjoy programming and to be happy. This is the primary purpose of the Ruby language. Isn't it interesting how he also, between the lines, describes the incentives from self-actualization, making me happy, to self-transcendence, making many, many other programmers happy? It's equally interesting to see how he's projecting the same Japanese sentiment that's currently sweeping the world via the phenomenon that is the KonMari method. That the things you surround yourself with are obligated to spark joy. And if they don't, you should thank them and send them on their way. This is radically different from the Western ethos of the best tool for the job of inanimate objects whose sole purpose is to do a job. Not to spark joy or really any other emotion inside our perfectly rational modes of production and cognition. Inasmuch as we in the West refer to software in humanistic terms, it's generally only in the form of biological metaphors for components and systems, a lens of science very far removed from any sense of perceiving of software as a dance partner in a humanistic waltz. Matt's, on the other hand, is decidedly humanistic in his approach. That is, putting the human at the center, with all our flaws and impulses, and making the machine secondary. Make Ruby natural, not simple, in a way that mirrors life. In this regard, Matt draws on a rich tradition of looking beyond rationality as the only virtue to strive for, or as all humankind needs. This is from Notes from Underground, Dostoevsky. You see, gentlemen, reason is an excellent thing. There's no disputing that. But reason is nothing but reason and satisfies only the rational side of man's nature, while will is a manifestation of the whole life, that is, of the whole human life, including reason and all the impulses. Here I, for instance, quite naturally want to live in order to satisfy all my capacities for life, and not simply my capacity for reason. That is not simply one twentieth of my capacity for life. Natural, not simple. Rational, but not just. This is what the acceptance of human nature looks like. An acceptance that must see expression not only in our philo philosophical rumination, but in everyday life and work. And I think it's the failure to do so that breeds much of the discontent and even angst in the, ang in the minds of many programmers. Stuck as they are in this enlightenment prison of rationality, only free to indulge that one twentieth of life that is our rational side. This may be true of much of Western society in general, but I think it afflicts software practitioners in particular because of our founding roots in the temples of rationality, mathematics and physics. Computer science is still seen as primarily the discipline we use when it comes to creating software. As our narrator from the underground would say, science is but one twentieth of software development. An important part, but completely insufficient as both a way to understand and to practice software development. One of the ways that the focus on computer science and software development leads us astray is with the notion of objective truths. When you're comparing two algorithms for sorting, you can mathematically prove which is better if you set the terms of the competition. Are we optimizing for speed or memory or some combination? It's possible to declare a definitive winner that we can all agree upon because, you know, science. That's good. That's fine. That's science as it's supposed to work. 
The problem is when we extend that scientific quest for capital T truth to the other 19 twentieths of software development. Take static versus dynamic typing as just one example. When I got started in the late 90s, this was a hot topic, fiercely contested. Now, 20 years later, it's uh, still a hot topic and fiercely contested. Just witness the excitement about TypeScript or the inklings of a movement around the same for Ruby, both part of a continued litigation over its superior fit for creating fault-free software. But this is not a question we're going to answer with science. Decades upon decades of empirical data have been produced, studied, and argued, and yet we're no closer to declaring a universal victory for neither static or dynamic typing. That should tell us something, that we're using the wrong scale to weigh our options. The same, by the way, is true for object-oriented versus functional programming and a litany of other fiercely contested territories in software development. But if science is not going to tell us how best to write software, what or who will? The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard might have an answer for us in the paradox of personal truths, which he explored in Fear and Trembling, amongst other places, that the conclusion to wrestling with the unknowable is to take a personal leap of faith, to find and commit to a set of personal truths to guide our lives and our work, with the understanding that these truths are our choices, not based on universal facts, that these choices can never be based on universal facts, the kind of answers you seek when you reach the boundaries of science and rational inquiry. This is really just a strand of existentialism 101. There is no universal meaning to life. You've been thrown into this world without a preordained purpose, which is both a terrible burden to bear and the ultimate freedom to embrace. You get to decide. But you cannot consciously accept that and start your personal search until you've given up on the idea that someone is going to reveal it to you if you just need, read another best tool for the job ode on Hacker News. Broadly speaking, at this level of abstraction, like static versus dynamic typing or OO versus FP, there is no best tool for the job, only a best tool for that person at that moment in their life for that job, a set of personal truths to be discovered and decided upon by each individual practitioner. This is a seriously frightening conclusion, that you're responsible for your own truth when it comes to many of the biggest questions at work, or for that matter, in life. Accepting this burden is not for the faint of heart. So many don't. They try to escape from freedom. Overwhelmed, they want someone else to choose for them. And thus we get the endless jockeyings for signs of what we're supposed to do. That is, what are others doing? What's the hot new thing? How do we measure hotness? Is it the number of Google searches? Is it the most recent release? What is it? Oh, please, wise interwebs, won't you please make the choice for me? And we keep reinforcing this sense of resignation. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not qualified to make authentic choices. Bullshit. If you keep modeling yourself on the meme of a dog who's, come on, let's face it, never going to learn how to program that computer, <laughs> don't be surprised if you end up stuck at the canine level of competency. You're responsible, yes, but also you can do this, yes. Anyway, you could say that Rails has benefited from this abdication of freedom for years itself, as it was seen as the new hotness. And I, in my lack of understanding from what actually motivated me to do the work, cheered it on. Look at that cool new startup using Rails. Look at that celebrity programmer endorsement. Look at those download counts. How many authentic choices were made during those days? I don't know, but I'm sure a lot of them weren't, which is a nice post hoc rationalization for embracing our current state of maturity as a community. But I think it's 
actually much easier to authentically choose rails today than it was 10 years ago at the peak of the hype in 2009. In Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl describes life in the German concentration camps during World War II. Or rather, he describes the death and its cause, as he saw it. That humans have an unbelievable resilience and capacity to endure, even in the hardest of circumstances. But only if they can see a purpose. Once the purpose is gone, the will to live extinguished, death soon followed. Those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. From this personal and harrowing experience, Frankel developed logotherapy, his psychotherapeutic method for helping people deal with a range of mental illnesses like depression and anxiety. His key belief was that the root of many of these conditions was to be found in exist existential angst, a loss of meaning, a loss of purpose. And as if meaning and purpose could be rediscovered, you'd be addressing the source of the condition. I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of people in software development struggle with mental health issues. I think a significant portion of those struggles, including my own, stem from a core lack of meaning in our work. And the cognitive dissonance that arise from thinking about our industry exclusively in rational, market-based terms. I think it's why so many startups in technology are so eager to boast about just how serious and important their mission is, even if it's evidently not so. They're trying to counterweight and compensate for the actual loss of meaning and purpose that a lot of us suffer under either periodically or chronically. Dropbox, our mission. We are here to unleash the world's creative energy by designing a more enlightened way of working. <laughs> For fuck's sake, Dropbox. <laughs> you host files. You make those files appear on all my computers. I like Dropbox, I use Dropbox, I pay for Dropbox. But it is not unleashing my creativity in any meaningful sense of either of those words. It stores my files. It's literally a filing company. Do you think filing cabinet companies of yesteryear bragged about unleashing the creative capacity of the whole fucking world? Of course they didn't. They wouldn't have gotten laughed out of church. But now there is no church on Sunday. It's just an all-nighter at the startup office. So it's no surprise that work now feels obligated to tend not just to our needs for making a living, but also for putting all the purpose into that living, since there's frequently room for little else. Isn't that the epitome of the hustle culture that we're currently in? that you're stuck feeding these meaning-deprived startups all your waking hours, rendering it utterly impossible to build other pillars of meaning in your life? That is the trap of compress your life's work into a decade of hard work. It's betting all your logos, all your meaning, on a single unlikely to pay off ticket. And even if it does pay off in the sense that what you've worked on turned into be a success, you might still wake up to a crisis of meaning. Just ask uh, Brian Acton, co-founder of WhatsApp, about that. He made one of the biggest slam dunks possible when he sold his company to Facebook for $19 billion. And yet, this is how he felt about it in an interview after leaving the company. I sold my user's privacy to a larger benefit. I made a choice and a compromise, and I live with that every day. As I personally think back on my two decades in this industry, I can recall several instances where I wrestled with this loss of meaning and purpose and faced both a professional and personal slump as a result. The first time when working for an enterprise Java shop back in 2001 that sold community software to large institutions. 
I wasn't writing any of the Java, I was writing the HTML, the JavaScript, and the JSP, but I kept being dumbstruck by the amounts of hoops and circles we jumped through at that circus to essentially sell PHP BB for a million dollars. My role in that show seemed so insignificant, so utterly pointless, like what am I even doing here? A complete lack of purpose, and as a result, a complete lack of motivation toward both my work and my betterment. I only worked there for nine months, but it seemed like the days dragged on for weeks, and the weeks dragged on for months. In terms of technical skills, I learned nothing. In terms of management of business, I learned everything not to do. The second instance of that that stands out is around the year 2009, 10 years ago, when I had been working at Basecamp for about six years. We had added all the features we thought made sense, all the big breakthroughs, all the major challenges had been met and addressed. We were left polishing the edges. At the same time, I was four years into living in a foreign country with an alien culture and had little to show in the sense of deep personal relationships for it. There was all this work I could be doing, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. At the time, I couldn't quite put my finger on why, I just knew that the motivation wasn't there. So I spent a lot of time procrastinating and seeing weeks go by with no progress. Partly this was because I simply felt I wasn't needed anymore. Sure, I could participate, but if I didn't, things would go on just as well. The main thing that kept me going professionally was working on Rails. I was suffering what from what clearly felt like burnout at Basecamp. Not from overwork, but from underpurpose. But being able to keep my brain engaged with Rails soothed the soul. Working on open source outside of the context of the marketplace and its expectations was a lifeline. And thankfully, the slump at Basecamp didn't last. Not long after, we wrote a new book, Rework. Um, we launched a brand new version of Rails, rewritten from scratch. And those projects snapped me out of my funk. Suddenly I had a clear purpose where my unique talents as a writer of both essays and software continued to make a difference. This is the snowball effect of meaning at work. You don't have just a fixed pie of productivity to divide amongst your pursuits, be they commercial or open source. The pie expands and shrinks depending on your motivation and your mood. When one area of your life is contracting, it shrinks all the other areas along with it. And when one part of your life is expanding, others often follow too. It's a testament to the fact that you can indeed cultivate meeting, as Frankel discovered with logotherapy, and as the existentialists have been preaching. That by either changing your circumstances or your outlook, you can create or even invent meaning, which in turn then becomes self-sustaining because it feeds on itself. Doing meaningful work provides for a meaningful life, which inspires more meaningful work. It's recursive. But if it's possible for open source to create meaning in your work, it's also certainly possible to destroy it. Turn that which used to give you joy into that which now gives you dread. The open source world is full of examples of maintainers and contributors who ended up turning a labor of love into just that dead end of free labor and hating the work and sometimes themselves in the process. Let's return to Maslow's pyramid of needs and its insight of a supporting base. Maslow's insight was that it's difficult to impossible to strive for the peak of the pyramid if you have not tended to its base. Physiological needs precede safety needs, proceed all the way up to self-actualization and self-transcendence. So when a contributor to an open source project starts seeing their work lose connection to self-actualization, esteem, or even love and belonging, not only is it possible to, impossible to strive for self-transcendence, since that relies on a complete pyramid below it, it's also what causes someone to retreat to the more base levels of safety needs. This can happen either because they're out of ideas that they can connect to on a personal level because they've allowed themselves to think that the customer is always right, or because open source suddenly needs to shoulder their livelihood for one reason or another. For any of these reasons, it's surprisingly easy to end up feeling like what you're doing is free labor. And that's a rotten deal, because it is. If the base needs aren't satisfied through other means and you've lost connection to your higher strivings, the whole thing quickly devolves into a fight for survival. 
And that's how we get back to the discussion about sustainable open source software development. Let's start with that word, sustainable. Because I think it sets us up for the false premise right from the get-go, if we're not careful. Its first association pulls us right into that beautiful meadow that must be guarded from the overgrazing in the tragedy of the commons. Sustainability is inherently linked with the concept of scarcity. It's hard to stop that spiral of aggrievement once you've chosen to look at open source software development this way. It's the way of Stallman and the GPL license. Walking around with the scowl that someone might take your software and do things to it that you wouldn't like. Extending it without sharing those extensions. That to me has just never seemed like a very appealing temperament. I'm not interested in making software together with people or companies who would rather not who are extorted into collaboration by a software license. Maybe that worked for Linux, but it seems like a pessimistic, angry, and frankly counterproductive way to entice and actually respect people. It reminds me of the book, The Self-Driven Child, in which authors Stickroot and Johnson take the position that rather than acting as a manager, you should act as a consultant in, in dealing with your children, nudging kids towards good outcome, but ultimately respecting their self-control. I've been a parent for about six years now. We have two kids and a third on the way. And it's hammered home the reality of just how hard it is to get someone to do a thing they don't want to do. <laughs> and not just hard, but counterproductive and short term. You might get a temporary level of compliance, but it's not exactly an enthusiastic or creative one. And a relationship based on forced compliance is ultimately one that relies on threats, shaming, berating, or worse. It's not exactly a loving or productive one. Maybe I'm reaching again here, but uh, if we take the poster child of the GPL, Linux, and we look at the person who's been in charge there for a long time, Linus, I see similarities. That of an angry, berating, threatening manager who's extracting contributions out of collaborators. I don't see that as a healthy model. But now as we've explored, the MIT license is very different. And I think it sets a completely different tone for the working relationship between open source contributors than does the GPL. But it's not a bulletproof vest. And if you're tumbling down the pyramid of needs and you don't land until you hit security and safety, it's still possible to superimpose the debts, rights, extractive value system of the GPL on top of it. In that context, haunting or shaming adopters for not doing their part can start to make sense, at least to the aggrieved person. Here's what made sense to me over the past two decades of sustaining an active open source involvement. This is my personal truth. To resist the temptation to treat my open source work as a set of transactional market-based exchanges. That personal truth has brought profound meaning to my life and a much needed escape. And should your personal pyramid of needs allow it, I invite you to do the same. To reject the, this utopian parallel universe with questions like, what can this do for me? What can you do for me? Am I getting enough back from what I put in? Open source, as seen through the lens of the MIT gift license, has the power to break us free from this overly rational cost-benefit analysis bullshit that's impoverishing our lives in so many other ways. It's a lens that isn't smudged by the tragedy of the commons, where we find meaning in our work, and I mean that in the broadest sense, not just in what you're employed to do, to go beyond getting the job done and to connect with other practitioners as other humans and not just as market participants. A way to create bonds free of quid pro quo reciprocal expectations. To borrow a phrase from Stallman, free labor as in free under freedom, not free as in gratis. Free from demands, free from debt, free from shame, free from repayment. And this part I'm still working on myself. Free from having to sell to reject measuring my worth in the same bullshit measures of engagement that's driving the wider world off a cliff. 
free to pursue intrinsic motivation from a quest for autonomy, mastery, and purpose that isn't shackled solely by employment or business, free to reach for self-transcendence that lies in giving away the best of what you got and asking nothing in return. So, to kick off this mindset, I'd like to borrow an ancient concept from the history of debt, the jubilee. I hereby declare a jubilee for all imagined debt and obligations you think you might owe me or the Rails community as a whole. Let no one call upon you to ever feel obligated to repay this vanquished debt. Contribute to the Rails community because it brings you meaning to your life because writing Ruby sparks joy. Don't participate if it doesn't. Either way, you're whole and we're square. This is a gratis tablet of Dramamine for the nausea of your otherwise market-soaked life. Along with an open invitation to make socialized software together. Thank you very much. <laughs>